Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Innovation Expo 2022. I'm Ian Mendes, uh, going to be serving as your MC, your host, kind of your navigator for the next 90 minutes or two hours or so. Um, really excited to be a part of this. Anytime the Royal reaches out and asks me to be a part of something, I'm excited, but I'm super excited about this one because when they pitched the idea, I thought this is going to be a lot of fun, and there's a little bit of drama here. Uh, as well as we got a couple of uh, really unbelievable prizes to, uh, to to give away. So if you're not familiar with this event, this is the fourth annual uh, Innovation Expo. And this year, CAMH is excited to be co-hosting with, uh, as I mentioned, the Royal. Uh, glad to see a lot of you here. If you are on social media, would love if you could kind of uh, give this a little bit of a bump using the hashtag uh, CAMH X Royal Expo uh, and, and make sure you give a, a tag to the Royal and uh, CAMH as well. So here's what we're going to have for you today uh, coming up. So I'm just going to kind of set the table for you to what, what you might be able to expect in the next 90 minutes to uh, to two hours. OK, we're going to have some opening remarks from uh, from Damian Jankowitz. We're going to have a keynote speech from Dr. Mohammed uh, Mamdani. Uh, then we're going to move into a discussion panel that's going to feature uh, industry experts, thought leaders, they're going to talk to you a little bit about their experiences, how they drive innova innovation in the workplace. And then we're going to move to the really exciting part. I think this is going to be really fun uh, this morning because we're doing this Dragon's Den style. OK, we've got a pair of fifty thousand uh, dollar awards for funding here. Uh, one from, you know, uh, where we've got six teams here uh, from CAMA, uh, CAMH and the Royal. And uh, they're going to pitch their ideas. Like I said, Dragon's Den style. So this is going to be a lot of fun. And these two $50,000 prizes are courtesy of uh, the University of Ottawa Institute for Mental Health Research uh, at the Royal, uh, the CAMH Foundation's Gift of Life. And so that's a lot of support here. And this is obviously a, a really uh, cool prize for, for uh, a couple of groups to win. So even if you're not part of the pitch teams, we want you to know that you also have a chance to come away a winner here on this uh, on this Wednesday. We're going to be doing a draw for a couple of tablets. Like, who wouldn't want a couple of tablets, right? So um, during this event, stay tuned for the details. We've got some fun trivia, too. So this is going to be a lot of fun. So as I mentioned, Damian Jankowitz is standing by. So without any uh, further ado, let me hand it over to Damian, and he's going to uh, deliver our opening remarks here on this uh, on this Wednesday. Thank you very much for the Ian for the introduction and thank you very much for hosting our event today. My name is Damian Kovic. I'm the Vice President, Chief Information Officer and Chief Privacy Officer at CAMH and Vice President and Chief Information Officer at the Royal Ottawa Healthcare Group. I'm so excited to be here today representing really a collaboration between two leading mental health hospitals in Canada. As Ian mentioned, uh, the CAMH, ha uh, CAMH has sort of had this event for, for four years now and this year we're Part, we're partnering with the Royal. Uh, and really this year, we're bringing together some of the brightest minds at both CAMH and the Royal for a common cause, bringing grassroots innovation to mental health. Now, over the last two years, the pandemic has brought into focus a simple fact. The status quo in mental health care is not acceptable. We have to find new ways to deliver care. We have to find new ways to partner, as we're seeing here today. We have to find new ways to adopt and scale digital, we have to find new ways to co-create with patients. In other words, we have to find new ways to innovate. Now, here is really good news. The really good news is that our organizations are brimming with innovation. 44, that's right, 44 innovations have been submitted to Innovation Expo this year. That's over 100 people submitting innovations between both CAMH and the Royal. All sorts of ideas at all sorts of stages of development, some brilliant initial concepts, some working prototypes, some full-fledged initiatives to be scaled. You'll see all of that today. Uh, and, you, and the innovations have come from all, every nook and cranny of our organizations, frontline staff, clinicians, researchers, corporate services, and SAM in collaboration with our patients. Now, the goal of Innovation X is simple. It is to keep opening up our organizations to innovation, especially innovation that comes from all of us. Now, the challenge for our organizations is to make innovation purposeful, such that, the, such that it drives real change for our patients and is scalable and inclusive so that innovation benefits all patients and not just a few. 
And that's why I'm really thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Mohamed Mamdani, who will talk about who will talk to us about purpose-driven innovation. A few words about Mohamed. Dr. Mamdani is Vice President of Data Science and Advanced Analytics at Unity Health in Toronto and Director of University of Toronto Timurdy Faculty of Medicine, Center for Artificial Intelligence, Intelligence Education and Research in Medicine. Dr. Mamdani is also a professor at the University of Toronto, senior scientist at ICES and faculty, faculty affiliate at the Vector Institute. Dr. Mamdani holds a director, doctor of pharmacy degree from the University of Michigan, Michigan, fellowship from Detroit Medical Center, master of arts degree in economic, econometric theory from Wayne State University, and master of public health from Harvard University. He has been previously named among Canada's top 40 under 40 and has published over 500 studies in peer-reviewed healthcare journals. Now here's an interesting fact. Dr. Mamdani was our dragon at the first Innovation Expo a few years ago, and he was a pretty tough but fair uh, dragon. Uh, Dr. Mamdani is a world-renowned leader in healthcare artificial intelligence, and his work bridges advanced analytics with clinical and management decision-making to improve patient outcomes and hospital efficiencies. The title of Dr. Mamdani's keynote is Purpose Driven Innovation. Thank you, Mohammed, for being here. Over to you. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And I, I'm, I'm really thrilled uh, that I was invited to, to give this uh, just a brief talk. I'm going to start with a bit of a story. About seven years ago, a couple of researchers from my institution, I'm based at St. Michael's Hospital, Unity Health Toronto, we flew out to Hong Kong and met with a team of uh, a very wealthy philanthropist, Mr. Lee Cushing, uh, who is the richest man in, in Asia and a uh, visionary. And he had a very simple vision for us. I want data to help people. Very simple, I want data to help people. So we flew back to Toronto and we actually looked at how can data help people? And, and we found a, a case that was really important. This is an actual case from our hospital from uh, a few years ago. She was a 73 year old retired nurse. She came in with an inflamed gallbladder or cholecystitis was in the inter internal medicine unit. Uh, it's a fairly fairly common case. We usually see these cases quite a bit at our hospital. Had a diagnostic workup done. Um, and the plan was to discharge her home the next day. Unfortunately, the physician was called that evening. The patient had shortness of breath, so the physician ordered chest x-rays and labs. The vital signs were checked twice overnight. Now, the next morning, the physician was called because there was a sudden drop in, in blood pressure. The patient started deteriorating and unfortunately, she died later that day. The family was understandably distraught. <clears throat> and they said, you know, we would never have left her bedside because she was suffering. The reality is one out of 12 internal medicine patients will die in the hospital. So what can be done? When we asked our internal medicine team, they told us, you know, we, we could have increased monitoring. We could have looked for signs of sepsis and initiated antibiotics. We could have called a critical care response team just to be on standby. We could have called a palliative care team. We could have communicated with the patient and the family, and we could have done all of this much earlier, and it may have actually saved that life. So the challenge was, can we use data to predict well in advance who will die or go to the ICU so we can intervene earlier and provide that life-saving care? So that, that was our challenge, and that's what we did. We developed an artificial intelligence algorithm which monitors all of our general internal medicine patients. So if you come to the hospital at St. Michael's Hospital, if you're in internal medicine, you will be monitored by artificial intelligence. What the algorithm does is every hour on the hour, it grabs data from all of our internal medicine patients and it, it predicts at least 48 hours in advance if a patient is going to die or go to the ICU. It categorizes patients as low, medium, and high risk. As soon as the high risk threshold is reached, it pages the medical team. The medical team then comes and sees that patient within the hour and their care pathways that then they uh, consider. So we've deployed this. It's been about a year and a half um, in October of 2020. And what we've been able to see among our high risk patients in our internal medicine units, our preliminary data are suggesting at least a 15 to 20% reduction in mortality. These are lives that we're actually seeing saved through data 
and through artificial intelligence, through that vision that Mr. Lee had actually given to us to enact. Now, we're not completely satisfied because we'd love to see this technology go to other hospitals. And it's taken us a little bit of time, but we very thoughtfully partnered with an incredibly capable group who's very passionate about healthcare and very passionate about moving the agenda to drive change to health. That we're able to, to uh, assemble this team and uh, attract uh, over $10 million in private sector funding to launch a startup called Signal One. And we just recently launched it a few weeks ago. Now that's great. We wanna bring this to the rest of the world. But according to Forbes, 98% of digital health startups will fail. And the number one reason they fail is the value proposition. Choosing a product idea without market need. What that basically tells you is a lot of these people don't really understand healthcare. They don't understand the problems that healthcare faces. There's a famous quote from, from Einstein. Uh, and Einstein has said, if I had only one hour to save the world, I would spend 55 minutes defining the problem and only five minutes finding the solution. There's a lot of wisdom in that. So why do we innovate? Why are we here to innovate? Some people will say, I want to do that startup and I want to make a bunch of money. That's the purpose. That's the motivation. That's the drive. It's financial. But I would submit to you a much greater purpose, a much greater drive. And that would be to care for patients who are in need of care. I would argue that you're in an incredibly uh, inspiring position where you're able to care for people who are in their most vulnerable state. All this is about providing hope for those who feel hopeless. It's providing a voice for the voiceless. It's not so much digital health or AI or the tech tools. It's really this sense of purpose to help people that will transform healthcare that will result in better care for all of us that I think will drive change that society needs. So the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, uh, the Royal, very, very fortunate. This group belongs to world-class institutions that many aspire to. And it's up to us to take advantage of such incredible institutions and people around us and the opportunity that we have to serve patients. So I'm privileged and honored to have the opportunity to speak to so many passionate individuals at this inspiring event who want that transformation, that change that will move society forward. So with that, let's all go and create the future of healthcare. Thank you. All right, that was terrific. Dr. Uh, Mohammed Mamdani, thank you so much for that. That was very insightful. And uh, listen, I'm, I'm a sports guy, so I'm, I love analytics. And I love that anecdote uh, from, from Mr. Lee about how can we use data to help people? I, I love it because, um, like I said, I, I like to lean into analytics and uh, uh, in, in a far less uh, uh, serious role in sports, but it, to, to see it being able to be applied uh, in, in healthcare is really remarkable. So I appreciate that. That was really insightful. And uh, I think gave us a lot to, to think about. Even I love that Einstein quote too, about how to uh, get an hour to save the world. So that was, uh, that was terrific. Thanks for, uh, for taking the time to, uh, to drop by and, and give us that, uh, that um, keynote talk about the importance of tech and innovation. Uh, before we move on to the panel discussion here, uh, I want to welcome our panelists who's going to, who are basically going to be your judges today. Uh, for the pitch competition, pitch portion of this uh, event. So we're going to kind of go around the horn here, and I'm going to do uh, a, a brief introduction of everybody who's going to be a part of this from a um, from a judging perspective. So we'll start. Um, first person I'd like to introduce is uh, Joanne Bezubets, who is the president and CEO uh, at the Royal. And uh, Joanne has more than 30 years experience uh, in healthcare leadership. So I think we're, yeah, look at this. We're bringing everybody up onto the screen. So maybe as I introduce you, you can just give a little bit of a wave. So everybody knows. So Joanne, uh, is, uh, is part of this. Uh, we got Tracy MacArthur, uh, president and CEO at CAMH, who, uh, has again, also more than 30 years of experience in academic healthcare leadership. Nicola Urbani, uh, 
Nicola is the executive director of innovation at the University of Ottawa, who's got a passion for innovation and a broad experience in venture capital investment, <coughs> life science and uh, clean tech industries. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome to Nicola. Uh, Alicia uh, Samuels is the uh, senior VP of information technology at Holt Renfrew, spent 24 years working in the uh, fast paced technology and business environment. <coughs> Megan Maltby, um, is the manager of uh, Accelerator Programs and Investor Relations at Invest Ottawa, who oversees um, the operations and uh, program delivery of acceleration programs for early stage technology clients. Last but not least, uh, we've got Dr. Brian Wong, director of uh, the Center for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety at Sunnybrook Health <coughs> Sciences Center. So. Um, this is uh, fantastic to have everybody uh, into the mix. So, like I said, these uh, these people are going to be our judges uh, throughout the course of uh, uh, this uh, this morning. And at this point, though, we've got a great panel discussion coming up here. And at that point, I'm going to turn things back over uh, to Damien, who's going to act as our <coughs> moderator for this uh, panel discussion. So, Damien, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Ian. So I'm so thrilled to have our CEOs here uh, as our panels. I know that uh, Tracy and Joanne, you wouldn't miss the innovation event if, <laughs> for anything. Um, you know, I still can't believe that we had 44 innovations across the two institutions, over 100 people submitting this, these innovations. You know, I, I guess this begs the question, how do we bring these innovations to the front lines and through the front lines to our patients where they can make the biggest difference? Tracy, um, perhaps I can start with you. Um, you know, how do we do that? Thanks, Damien, and hi to everyone out there. This is my favorite event by far. Uh, and many of you know, uh, in addition to now being the CEO of ChemH, I was a CIO before. So my absolute favorite discussions are about the intersection of uh, data technology and how we can improve, uh, improve healthcare. You know, I think the important part, uh, you know, I could I, I could name many, many opportunities, but it's engaging our frontline staff. And this is why this activity is so exciting, uh, because we're actually engaging those who are working uh, in the front line uh, to to come up with some of the innovations. And we all know, you know, especially as you uh, strive to be a learning health organization, engaging those who are closest to the work is the most important factor. Uh, you know, to move in, to move innovation forward. So if you combine all of these wonderful ideas with the, in the data uh, that Mohammed was talking about and like excellent ability to execute, which we're trying to drive with investment here, uh, you know, I think that's a wonderful recipe uh, for, for success. Thank you, Tracy. Jo Joanne, how, how do you see sort of bringing innovations to the front lines? You know, I have to agree with Tracy and uh, what resonated with me um, what uh, Dr. Mamdani discussed was uh, to really focus on the market need. And I think that that comes from clients and family members themselves as well. And for sure, uh, the fabric between frontline staff and clients and family members is a very thin fabric. As a matter of fact, I would see them as being those who know best on how to um, how to come up with these innovative ideas that would result in improved care for clients and family members. There are a couple of other byproducts of innovation that we also look for, and I think uh, clients and family members would benefit from. And one of those ideas is definitely improving the access and making it more generally available to a larger group of of individuals who need care. And I think um, what we've seen through the pandemic is that equalizing access through innovation and continuing to provide services to those who need them as much as possible through innovations, things that haven't been tried before, and uh, you know, just that general sense of new possibilities. And so I I'm excited about today, and I love the competitive nature of coming together because it does make everybody better. That bar is not just there for winners, it's there for all of us. And I think what's so inspirational about today is the fact that we've had so many people interested in coming forward 
and it really does set the stage for the future. So, you know, so it's interesting. We talk about bringing innovation to the front lines. Nicola and Megan, you had a lot of experience with uh, innovation ecosystems. And for example, in pharma, you have, you know, this traditional model where you actually have a lot of funding to bring new drugs to the, to, to, to be tested and trialed within, for example, hospital settings. But you don't see that with digital innovations, for example, and you don't see it that much in the mental health space, especially with digital innovations. You know, how do you bridge that gap how do you, you know, how do you, how do you sort of start to bridge that gap? Megan, ladies first, eh? feel free. Sure. Yeah. Nice to see you again, Nicola, by the way. Um, so I think the reason that a lot of investors don't prioritize this with digital health firms is just simply they see it as not a requirement. So oftentimes software solutions are faster to market, faster to revenue, and therefore faster to a return for these investors. So I really think it is up to the founder to first and foremost, make sure they're talking to the right sort of funders who are familiar with this space and the importance of doing this testing and then speak their language. So especially with many health tech companies, we do see the founders from a more technical background, but they forget that it is possible to show the purpose of this testing and why it will help you gather the appropriate data to then go out and sell and actually get into the market. Um, so we have one client that's done this very well, Truwalta, and they have a ed tech startup, um, but they focus on providing training and education for primary caregivers. So those are family members that might need care, but aren't yet ready to go into an institution. They were not required to do any testing to actually start selling, but they saw the value in gathering outcomes so that they could still have a greater entry point into the market. Yeah, I, I think, um, well, the two points. The, the first one is uh, obviously when, when you're in, in, in um, uh, supporting companies that are uh, in, in clinical trials, the developing therapeutics, uh, just the sheer number of, uh, of patients that you need to go through phase one, phase two, phase three, especially in areas like cardiovascular, it requires a huge amount of money, which is not necessarily the case in digital uh, space. Uh, but having said that, and I remember looking at a number of, uh, of when I was in the venture capital world, maybe 40, 50 different uh, uh, startups. And um, and it, it was difficult for me to grasp, sometimes to grasp, okay, but how is this really going to work? There's a number of competitors here. How do you define yourself compared to them? What are you doing different? Because we're always, we were always looking for, you know, the, 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 the unicorn, uh, the, the, the blockbuster, uh, disruptive technologies it, it was difficult to kind of grasp as to why this one was better than the others and so on although we did invest in a few uh, when we could understand uh, the, the clear value proposition uh, specifically um, uh, indications and that have been validated and so forth uh, we did invest because we did saw value i remember Essentia in quebec blue light in halifax imagine montreal we did those uh and because we could understand a bit better sometimes it's a bit confusing for investors how is this going to pan out and uh, ultimately they, they have to show returns although many f sophisticated investors are often more uh, drawn to the, what the unmet medical needs are and how to find solution to einstein point uh, right uh, but at the end of the day, they also have to show return. And if that is not clear in their mind, they'll, they'll walk away. So I think I hope this is useful. You know, we've seen we've seen tons of innovation through uh, during the pandemic and, and uh, in all sorts of sectors, of course, in healthcare, but in other sectors as well. Um, but I guess the question now is, how do we keep this? How do we sort of sustain this innovation and how do you sort of keep sort of developing some sort of a, uh, long-term structures that would allow us to do that. Uh, Brian, let's start with you. How, how do you think we can sustain this innovation in healthcare? Well, if I think about, you know, where we're headed with respect to, you know, um, the world or life beyond the pandemic, um, I think w it's important to just recognize the context in which the innovations are going to be occurring in. And then it's in the context of a very strained health system um, where uh, we've recognized that health human resource uh, constraints are going to place a huge ongoing burden to um, the ability to deploy and implement and see the full value of various types of uh, healthcare innovations. 
And so I think it's really important to go back to Mohammed's point around the value proposition. I think the innovations that we bring forward really do need to be able to demonstrate the value uh, for uh, patients, families, our community members, and also to the provider groups that are, are going to be tasked with um, helping to uh, refine them and make them uh, work well for the patients and communities that we serve. Um, you know, I think we have a huge challenge ahead of us. Uh, we know there's been a backlog of care and, and, and nowhere more is that true in mental health where we know that there are people that have not had their care needs met. And so how can we leverage innovation to start addressing some of these really pressing needs in a way that is meaningful, um, that is mindful of the limited resources that we have available to us and I think the most limited resource that we're seeing right now are the health human resources um, with respect to trying to implement uh, these types of changes. The other thing I would just say is, is that just being very mindful of um, linking uh, our design of our innovations to the problems that they're seeking to solve. And I think that quote by Einstein is very telling. If we don't understand what problem we're trying to solve, if we don't understand how the innovation is intending to solve it, there's a real risk that we'll end up introducing changes that um, go uh, serve to create more problems, uh, create more challenges, um, rather than solve the problems that we're trying to solve. And so I think um, if we can just establish a clear link between the innovation and the problems that we're trying to solve and the ways in which we're trying to improve health for our patients and populations will go a long way to sustaining the most meaningful innovations uh, for, for our health system. Uh Alicia, so in healthcare, we're always preoccupied with healthcare, but of course, the whole system, everybody was innovating during the pandemic. You have a, a senior role um, in a commercial entity. How, how do you how do you sustain innovation going forward? Well, it's a great question because as the as the themes were coming out from the keynote and across our panelists, and we're talking about um, that value proposition in my industry as well. When we take a look at technology and we take a look at what we're trying to do to achieve our strategic objectives, the innovation is really around what are we trying to solve, and so that is um, a cultural mindset um, where. It's the pandemic brought it out after you know, we were we had to advance technology at a pace that we hadn't seen before, which was great for technologists in the industry. We're like, oh, this is great. Uh, we're advancing um, the pace and we're getting some things done that we've been talking about for a while. But in order to continue to to move forward, um, it becomes uh, it, you have to, to really foster and care for that mindset of innovation and it becomes um, a, a conversation around how do you build that out and the people and the resources that you have, um, that test and learn, that agile mentality um, in order to bring it forward, and how do you, you use that to sustain it, always with that um, end in mind, which is the value prop. If we're not doing it in, in order to um, unlock value for the customers that we see or, or patients care in, in healthcare, then we're not doing it in the right way um, and it may not get that alignment and support. So being able to make that change from a mindset perspective or a cultural perspective and, and having the resource really under, resources that we have in our organization understand that we're there to help support um, innovation. Um, we want to be able to move at a pace uh, that unlocks value is gonna be critical for us. Uh, so it's culture, it's it's resources, it's mindset, it's that that design thinking and that change that needs to happen um, and the ability of the executive teams to be able to support the teams moving forward to get that done. That's how we're looking at it within my industry. Thank you, Alicia. So, you know, uh, we don't have a lot of time, so let's take it a little bit personal. What has been your greatest sort of personal lesson in pursuing innovation within your work uh, and your organization? Tracy, let's start with you. Okay, and I have some very loud construction next to me, so so apologies if you're hearing some banging noises. Uh, you know, personally, uh, you learn a great deal from failure, and while I've had a lot of success, I've had a lot of failures as well. And I just want to go back and amplify, you know, Brian and Alicia's point. Uh, and I know Brian, you teach this at, in your classes at U of T, and it's but I cannot underscore this point enough. When you do not understand the problem you are trying to solve, you'll fail. Uh, and the problem you're trying to solve 
can't be, you know, just to make things better organized and fit neatly in a box. It actually has to be a real problem that's going to drive improvement in outcomes. And when I've gone down a path where I either haven't understood that problem well, or the solution has been not something that's meaningfully going to impact an outcome like increase access or improve care, that's when you go down, you, you, you go down the wrong path. And just to use a very concrete example, you know, I'm very optimistic, despite all the pressures in the healthcare system coming out of the pandemic, because the pandemic taught us that we can move fast and we can be innovative. Uh, but when we are able to do that, it's because we're very aligned on a common purpose and that common problem that we're trying to resolve. At CAMH, for example, a lot of our outpatient clinics were closed. We had to pivot to virtual uh, care. That was the problem we needed to solve. It's been tremendously successful. As you know, we expanded from a few hundred visits a month to over 10,000 a month. That's sustainable. And then the second part is listening to patients. It's sustainable because patients love it. 90% and more like the, the, so it's telling us the, the solution we implemented has actually solved that problem. So back to the problem, uh, the Einstein quote, figure out what the problem is uh, or you'll waste an awful lot of time going down a lot of rabbit holes. That's fantastic. I think we have a theme emerging here. Uh, Joanne, what has been your sort of personal lesson around innovation? You know, I think the, um, the importance of the data continues to be a priority. And um, one of the uh, reasons why the data is important and the example that I'd like to give is in answering the question that's very similar to what is the problem and the question that really resonates for me is always who are not our clients and what are those barriers for those individuals who are not receiving the care that they're looking for so how can we use technology innovation digitization algorithms at our disposal or innovate them create them so that people who require services can have access to it and we've seen in uh, our services at the Royal that by asking that question, who are not our clients and why are they not getting the services they require, it really does drive that innovation. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, Megan, what about you? Sure, yeah. Um, so I definitely have a lot to share from the client experience side, but actually last fall at Invest Ottawa, we were able to kind of eat our own dog food. Um, we rolled out a software tool for vaccination registration for return to our incubation space, which houses a bunch of different tech clients. Um, and it ended up being quite a huge undertaking and took a lot longer than we expected. Um, and I think the key thing that we learned after it was it's really important to not only talk to the customers, but talk to all of the different frontline users of any sort of technical innovation. They all have different priorities and you really need to identify a project champion that's willing to talk to all of these different groups and make sure that you're advocating for the use case from each of their perspectives. So in our case, you know, some teams were more concerned about security and legal liability. Others were just concerned about getting people back into the building to kind of refresh that culture. Um, and then others are really worried about the safety component. So it's kind of important that you try to see it from all different sides. Let's change it up a little bit. Uh, um, Alicia, what, what's your sort of greatest personal les lesson around innovation? Well, it's interesting in my industry, um, when I take a look at what our future strategy is gonna be around technology, we tend to start thinking about and looking at, uh, at um, uh, in technology, we look at, at it five years out, right? What's changing, what's happening? And so all of the, the, the conversations right now that seem to be on trend are about the metaverse and you know what, what our kids are actually using as, as technology and how is that going to play out into how we interact with our customers. So um, it's always trying to be trying to understand and see um, what we're trying to achieve as a, a problem that we're trying to solve. Um, it was mentioned also in this panel about who it is that we're trying to solve it for, but it's also having that understanding and being at, at the um, being knowledgeable about what's actually happening in the Gen Z world. It's kind of that thought process of watch what your kids are, are using and how does that technology 
flow into how we're going to be um, you know, moving forward and being prepared for that foundationally so that when we reach that in the next five years, we're not a laggard. Right. And the example that I usually give is that, you know, with my kids in Roblox, you know, they're always asking me for Robux. And so you look at that technology and you look about how that that um, is aligned to what's going to be coming with the metaverse, as, as you know, the, everyone's talking about lately. It's your blockchain, it's your uh, AI, it's your AR um, and all of these technologies, data. Absolutely. All these technologies uh, are going to be coming in and uh, melding together. How are we going to be prepared for that? And what problem are we going to solve in the future with those technologies? Um, so being on, on top of that and understanding that becomes really important. Uh, and so that's one of the lessons that, that you learn about innovation is that we want to be able to innovate. We want to be able to, to leapfrog. Um, and we need to be futuristic in our thinking of technology, of where it's going to land in the next five years. And it's hard to do. And it goes back to that culture and that mindset and really understanding um, you know, having that design thinking, that, that creative thinking uh, as part of your team, as you're taking a look at some of these, these uh, emerging technologies that are going to impact your life in the next, next little bit, right? So that's kind of how I, I, I look at that lesson. It's really understanding what's coming. And, and listen to your kids. Listen to your kids. Watch <laughs> what they do. <laughs> that's always good advice in, in any scenario. Uh, Nicola, uh, what's your personal le lesson around innovation? You're mute. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, in, in, in the uh, academic innovation ecosystem, I guess one of the I interesting challenges I, I, I face is that is one of culture, really. Uh, uh, th that academic culture and how they perceive uh, 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 innovation, how they perceive uh, entrepreneurship, and what it really is in terms of uh, business and so on. Uh, there's a, there's a decalage. There's, there's a difference, and and that is I guess, actually our role is to bridge that gap in terms to um, uh, uh, kind of demystify some things: uh, the importance of intellectual property, uh, the connectivity with with uh, all sorts of uh, venture capital investor, early stage, uh, middle stage, and later stage. Uh, the legal mindset, uh, the market uh, mindset. This these are I guess the two uh, the, the two, two worlds we're trying to bring together and it's the most challenging uh, part of, of all I think uh, but it's 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 moving it, it's uh, it's uh, it's exciting I find because these are two very interesting ecosystems and they don't often talk enough at, at least not in Canada and uh, um, lots of challenges but lots of opportunities when we do it right Brian last words to you uh, around innovation yeah, so, you know, as the director for my center, uh, our Center for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety at the University of Toronto, we um, we really started to embark on a journey to um, have a focus on uh, health equity and equity in health and equity in healthcare. And one of the major learnings for me is, is that a lot of the solutions that we implement, um, they have the opportunity to address inequities. So for example, you know, maybe we provide virtual care to remote communities and we can help to um, provide greater access as we heard about before. But there's a risk that our innovations also leave certain groups behind, certain individuals behind, and we could widen disparities. And, you know, I read a, a quote recently that talked about the fact that, you know, improvement and in innovation that doesn't uh, improve care for all is a hollow victory. And, you know, I think one of the things that I would like to propose that we keep in mind as we think about our innovations is are we um, measuring the impact of our innovations on all populations? Um, do we involve and partner with, you know, patients, families, community members so that the solutions that we design are designed in a way that will help everyone and not just a, 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 the, the group in our, in our population that probably already are privileged and advantaged in ways that will improve um, irrespective of the innovations that we put in place. My worry is that innovations will widen disparities rather than narrow them. And I think you've done uh, meaningfully and thoughtfully. Um, we have the opportunity to leverage technology, leverage innovation to actually address uh, equity concerns. Um, so that's what I've um, learned to be aware of. Uh, what I'm hoping to continue to learn is how to actually mobilize towards that goal. And I think that's a real challenge, but one that I think uh, we're excited to face. Thank you very much, Brian. I think that's a that's a very important note to end this conversation on and, and leave in people's minds as we're 
you know, as we talking as, as we we've talked about making sure that the innovation benefits every everyone, uh, every patient that we serve, and that we don't serve. So, uh, with that, I would like to thank the panelists very much for your thoughts today, and uh, I'll turn it over to Ian. All right. Uh, terrific stuff, uh, Damien. Uh, appreciate that and everything from the panel uh, talking about your, uh, your your experiences. And I love that interaction. I, it was Alicia and Damien where, where the takeaway message was, listen to your kids. I feel like that was, uh, was uh, kind of evergreen advice that we can use <laughs> in all sorts of facets of our lives. So that was, uh, that was really compelling. And I appreciate uh, everybody for just taking the time to kind of share their reflections and, and experiences. So uh, now we're moving on to a really exciting part of this morning, and that is the Innovation Expo pitch competition. That's kind of the reason why I think a lot of us are here is to, to see who's going to uh, uh, come away with these uh, these fifty thousand dollar prizes. So uh, this year, uh, staff across CAMH and uh, the Royal got into teams to apply for the fifty thousand dollar prize from CAMH's Foundation's uh, Gifts of Life uh, Light program, sorry, and the University of Ottawa's uh, Institute for Mental Health Research at the Royal. And uh, the idea here is, listen, can we? Uh, put some of these funds towards innovative ideas that are going to directly impact patients at their respect, uh, respective hospitals. And um, altogether, as Damien mentioned, 44, 44 applications were put together here. And they were vetted by a selection uh, committee that were put together by both organizations. And then almost 300 uh, CAMH staff and more than 100 people, 120 people actually at the Royal, submitted a vote to select the People's Choice finalists. And that's where, we're are, uh, where we are today. So we've got six teams, three from each organization, and they're going to be uh, doing a pitch to our judging panel. And just so you know, from a housekeeping perspective, here's how it's going to go you're going to see a pre-prepared uh, kind of two-minute video from each of these six teams, okay? That's going to play. And then after their video plays, the judges are going to be able to ask questions uh, to the teams. And, and we're going to call this kind of a lightning round. We're going to ask that everybody tries to respect that we're, we're going to try to keep everybody's uh, – time to about three minutes so judges you're going to have about three minutes to grill up the teams with any questions that you have so um that's how it's going to work six videos six kind of q a lightning round uh um uh, sessions and then away we go so uh without any uh further ado let's uh, let's kick this thing off here and our first group presenting uh today is going to be the healthier group from cam h uh it's going to be presented by anna hall andrew johnson and daryl Beauchard. Confidence, self-determination, empowerment. In CAMH offices, clinicians inspire these feelings in patients and families. But outside the office, when our patients and families are by themselves, searching for mental health information online, how do they feel? Unfortunately, people often describe the experience of surfing the web for mental health information in different terms, as frustrating, difficult, and anxiety-inducing. Introducing our solution, the Healthier app, the Health Information e-Reader. The Health Information e-Reader is a digital library and more. It takes the vast collection of mental health resources developed by CAMH physicians and staff and puts it in the palm of your hand. CAMH has created hundreds of patient-centered, plain language physical resources that people usually pick up at CAMH, their doctor's office, in schools, or at local libraries. These are the easy to read, no jargon resources that take complex topics and give people the real facts. What can you find in the Healthier app? How to quit drinking or cut down? It's here. How to raise resilient children and youth? It's here. What to do when a family member is thinking about suicide? It's here. And hundreds of other publications too. How would we spend the $50,000 to develop this proposal? The specialist we've consulted suggests this budget can deliver a website with an integrated e-reader library, one that allows users to download resources as PDFs or as EPUBs to read on phones, tablets, or computers. Given our team's in-kind design personnel, front-end support, and user testing expertise, our budget would be directed toward developmental work on the back end and on the coding of our content to make it EPUB ready. 
Our proposed product not only serves the 34,000 patients that KMH provides clinical care to each year, it also serves their caregivers and the public at large. Beyond that, there is also the opportunity to share the world-class, patient-centered information that KMH continues to develop in-house with a global audience. All right. So thank you to the uh, Healthier Group for that. That looks like a terrific idea and a nice, clean way to try to disseminate, uh, you know, complex information. So here we go. The first lightning round of Q&A is uh, on tap. Again, you've got three minutes, so we'll turn it over. And uh, judges, the floor is yours. Thanks. I love this. Uh, in fact, it's probably one of the most common questions I get in my job. So qu quick question, what's the in involvement of patients and families in developing the material? That's a great question. And um, uh, about patient and family engagement in the development of our uh, products, everything we do in KMH uh, education is co-created with uh, families and, uh, and patients themselves. Uh, for this app itself, we have conducted focus groups um, prior to um, submitting this Innovation Expo pitch on uh, what do patients and families want to see, what style of information and what formats um, uh, to help develop a product that uh, would suit their needs and not just the needs of um, uh, our program. Um, Andrew and Anna might want to continue with that uh, answer. But certainly um, the, the content that will be in the uh, app as well is, is developed and vetted and uh, looked over prior to publication. It's developed um, most times with uh, Cambridge physicians, Cambridge staff, clinicians, uh, but always with the feedback of patients and families as well. So not just from the tech standpoint with the app itself, but with the content that we're embedding within the app is all appropriate with patients and families. I'll just hand it to someone else for questions. I have a question. I'm curious to hear a little bit about what you learned through your testing. What was your number one lesson of what you learned through your testing with your uh, priority populations? Um, yeah, I can take this one. Uh, I think um, what we learned through uh, doing user journey in um, workshops with our users was that we really need to offer um, a product that is um, laid out in plain language that um, addresses the fact that folks might be experiencing, you know, mental health problems when they're um, uh, using the product so something that uh, you know something that people can really um, just pick up and use really easily rather than having like medical jargon or have um, you know good information that's behind a paywall I actually have a question just about um, uh, privacy. Um, how would you manage, um, because in the, there's a mention that uh, there'll be personalization, um, uh, ability to um, be well used across the, the, the clinical units in the hospital. How do you manage the privacy between um, the usage of the app, the customer, the, the patients using the app and any information that's disseminated across other channels? Um, this is one of Andrew's expertise. Um, I think he's experiencing some tech issues uh, right now, so uh, I'll take a first stab at that. Um, it uh, certainly, in all the work we do in education at KMH, follows PHIPAA guidelines. Um, we do not want to uh, risk uh, um, any uh, privacy compromisation um, with this app. Um, so uh, we will not be collecting. Um, personal identifiable information uh, with this app. And um, uh, Anna, do you want to continue with that? Yeah, sure. So for the first um, iteration of this product, we will be creating um, 
a product that uh, folks won't be signing into um, quite yet. And um, it will be so folks can actually access the information without giving their um, private information. So later on in the later stages, they can potentially log in and then accept um, the, the fact that the, their data will be collected. But um, we want to have um, a product that will be available to everybody, whether they want to give their information or not. One question I could ask one more. I, I have a quick question, which is around the educational materials and just talk thinking about addressing the needs of the, the patients and families at, uh, at your institution. What about language? Um, how are you managing sort of different languages in the materials? And, and uh, is, this, um, is this something that's being uh, incorporated into your decisions around what content to include? Of course. Uh, KMH is um, all all of education's materials are uh, translated uh, in, into both English and French. So every resource will be available in English and French. Um, this is one of the uh, MOs of the education department and uh, KMH as a whole. In the um, past, we have also translated um, uh, our materials into other languages. Um, and we want to do that as much as possible. One of the uh, phrases that sometimes our department uses when things are asked to be translated into 20 or 30 languages is unfortunately back up the money truck because this can be very resource intensive to, um, to translate. Uh, but we've been getting better at it. We've been doing it more and more. We recently, um, in 2020, we created vaccine information sheets for the entire hospital and public beyond, and we translated those into 22 languages. So we can do it, we do have the resources to do that, and we're very interested in doing it as well. That's a, a great question, thank you. Okay, gang, we're going to, um, we're going to, uh, to end it there, and I wanted to thank the Healthier Group uh, for, uh, for that presentation. I'd like to introduce our next group here, uh, My Voice from the Royal, presented by Tony DeBono, Michelle Langlois, and Sharon Roberts. This is my voice. The Royals five-year strategy aims to expand access, hope, and new possibilities in care to better meet the mental health, substance use health, and addictions needs of the diverse communities we serve. The seeds of improvement and innovation to get us there lie in the collective lived expertise and wisdom of clients and families, as well as in the knowledge, responsiveness, and ingenuity of staff. Current client family feedback systems are reactive and dependent upon folks being at a particular place at a particular time. Implementing My Voice, a digital feedback system accessible via any device connected to the internet will be unique in its ability to gain a real time pulse on client and family experiences of care and their sentiments of hope. My Voice eliminates barriers to access space and time Clients and families will have the choice of using conveniently located kiosks and tablets at the Royal or simply using the internet via any device. My Voice goes where clients and families go. Knowledge is power and My Voice will empower staff with the evidence they need to implement improvements that hit the mark. My Voice will provide us with a signal of what resonates with our clients and families, allowing us to walk shoulder to shoulder with them, learning and growing together. My Voice offers a low cost, high impact solution that puts clients and families at the very center of everything that we do, all the while helping us expand access, infuse hope and generate new possibilities in care. We are paving the way for a new future. This is my voice. This is my voice. This is my voice. This is my voice. Okay, someone else go first this time. I have a question though. <laughs> I can take a question. I can 
Um, oh, sorry, you go ahead. Sorry. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about the business model? Who actually pays for the technology? Yes, thank you folks uh, for having us today. And I can start. Uh, so the technology itself and what we're looking for is the infrastructure costs for hardware and some simple software. So the tech side of this solution is actually um, rather basic. It's the innovation concept that we're really trying to hammer home in the, um, in the concept that data is really an asset class and that we really want to know what is our market telling us and our market is our clients. So the infrastructure costs are really for things like tablets and kiosks set up, as well as uh, the start of a basic subscription service for us to start the survey. But really this is meant to be embedded within uh, strategic alignment and, and uh, programs that already exist in the Royal, including our client and family relations department. Michelle, anything you'd like to add there? Well, given the reach, um, I would also like to add that we have the opportunity through this investment to capture uh, voices of the, the voices of the voiceless um, in the community that traditionally don't provide feedback. And so we're really excited about the potential to capture and include their voices to help inform change. I could jump in with my question. Um, how do you encourage uh, engagement in order to get that feedback? So that feedback would be would be great. Uh, and oftentimes it's hard to, to get attention of, of individuals to, to do a survey. Um, and a follow on to that would be how long would the survey be? And has this been uh, part of a proof of concept? Go ahead. Jimmy. No, feel free, Michelle. You go ahead and start. Well, at this uh, point in time, it's uh, a concept. We have uh, done some planning for sure. How do we, we plan to make it very visible? So by engaging clients, families, and co-creating with staff, um, we plan to integrate as part of our protocol to invite clients and families that are taking advantage of our services. Um, to, to complete some of these surveys, which are going to be very short in nature, very focused and purposeful. The other thing that I'd like to highlight is that we are going to ensure that there's signage um, and that we locate some of the kiosks in high traffic areas for visibility. Well, well said, Michelle. This is really a paradigm shift for us to start having conversations with our clients on an ongoing basis. It troubles me as a psychologist that uh, Google and YouTube and uh, other forms and other sectors and, and other forms of technology probably know more about their clientele in terms of big data accumulation over time. It's also really important to know that psychiatric and psychological institutions have not always been a safe space for folks. So we really wanna reduce barriers to provide feedback so that folks don't necessarily have to provide the feedback within our walls, but they're able to provide that feedback where it's safest and where it makes sense for them. In terms of the survey itself, again, we're looking for high impact. We don't need a lot of questions. We need targeted questions um, and we need to be able to accumulate a lot of that data. Can, can I ask a question about data? So thanks for lifting up the patient family voice. I think it's fantastic. Uh, have you thought about the data strategy? So are you going to be able to, is this just general information or are you gonna connect it to other key data points, like whether they're an inpatient, outpatient, family member, where, where they were visiting? Like, have you thought about uh, th those connections? Yes, we've started having these sorts of conversations and we're in sort of the early stage of this, but as part of our development, we had our director of data analytics, data analytics as part of these conversations. We're really hoping to develop an ecosystem. Now it would be fantastic depending on our um, electronic medical record system to have interface directly with that system perhaps, or with other aspects um, and data points within our organization, but precisely. The idea is it may start off in this more survey based platform. However, the idea is for full integration into the strategic planning of the organization so that we can actually make connections between data points. We're looking at both the client experience aspect as well as the hope aspect. And as we continue to mature the program, we're also going to want to know what our um, what our clinicians, our interprofessional staff, and our physicians um, have to say as well. 
Michelle? I, I don't really have anything to add. I'd like to make room for more questions. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, gang, that is all the time we have. We just, we're trying to keep these to three minutes if possible. So, um, and we're mindful of everyone's time here this morning. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We want to thank the, uh, the My, Vo uh, My Voice group for going there. Now let's uh, introduce our next uh, presentation. That's coming from Wise Minds from CAMH. And the presenters here, Alexander Daros, Lena Quilty, Matthew Sloan. Hey, everybody. My name is Alex Daros, and I'm a psychologist and research fellow at CAMH. Our proposed innovation is called Wise Minds. So, the need for mental health resources has never been greater. Technology is seen as a way to meet more of that demand. As we continue to navigate ongoing challenges due to global events, many people are having difficulties regulating their emotions, leading to an increase in mental health concerns. These emotion regulation difficulties lead to challenges in using adaptive strategies to cope, leading people to choose more maladaptive methods such as alcohol and substances instead. One intervention that was developed to improve emotion regulation is Dialectical Behavior Therapy, or DBT for short. DBT has a long history of helping people overcome many mental health challenges. Now, DBT is usually offered in specialized group and individual intervention settings. There's also self-guided workbooks that exist, but there are actually few online digital resources of DBT and none that feature people with lived experience. So, our proposed innovation is called Wise Minds a digital repository of DBT resources co-created by individuals with lived experience and by clinicians with DBT skills training. What we want to do is create short digestible videos and exercises that are about 5 to 10 minutes in length, featuring people of all ages and backgrounds explaining DBT concepts and skills in five different domains. We're going to co-design all of these different materials as well as suggestions for practice, and once complete, we're going to embed these resources onto a CAMH branded website for broad dissemination. We're going to work closely with patient, family, and youth engagement initiatives already in place at CAMH to recruit and engage a really highly diverse team. Wise Minds will create opportunities for individuals to learn valuable DBT skills in a new engaging format, thereby improving the accessibility of DBT. The co-creation of content will, with lived experience individuals will inspire others to learn, uptake, and practice these skills. CAMH and the greater community would benefit from an integrated community-led resource in which DBT skills are the major focus. Our overall goal is to help individuals choose more adaptive strategies to regulate their emotions, and in doing so, we hope to encourage and improve mental well-being in the process. Thanks for listening. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Wise Minds Group, uh, for that. Thank you for uh, for that presentation. So now, Wise Minds Group, you're on the hot seat. Uh, three minute lightning round, a Q and A session with the judges. I have a question. I'll I'll kick it off. Sorry, Nicola. Well, go ahead. Um, uh, so I'd like to hear from the group. How are you going to use the data that you obtain for future innovation? What's the data going to tell you? That's a, that's a great uh, question, actually. So, you know, all the data that we'll collect from this uh, website and, uh, and and web tool will go into understanding which, you know, skills are the most likely to be used, uh, which, uh, which uh, skills are the most engaged with, and what people enjoy the most from the different activities that we have planned for this. So I think that we'll be using the data to funnel uh, revisions and new and exciting features to the website or uh, take that and put it into a different package as well. That's a good question. I have a, a, a quick question here. Um, uh, thank you for, for this presentation. Uh, just wondering if, uh, to your knowledge, uh, whether you, you, you're aware of some similar approaches that are being developed elsewhere, uh, whether in Canada or abroad? Well, one of the reasons why we chose this uh, project or we developed this project is there's actually very limited DBT resources available. Um, I don't know if Matt, you want to speak towards that and uh, maybe some of the things at the hospital as well. Yeah, for sure. So I think most of the resources available, you know, even at a place like CAMH are, are very limited. So to get access to DBT groups, for example, you either have to have a personality disorder and be on a wait list for a very, very long period of time or you have to have been admitted to the hospital. 
um, which means the majority of our patients can't even access um, these skills groups and, and therapy groups. Um, and then in the community, it's even harder uh, to access DBT skills. So um, there's a few private clinics, but really, uh, you know, it's almost impossible to access DBT skills. And in terms of what, what else is out there right now, um, there are workbooks that you can get, um, but they're, they're kind of dry. Uh, it's sometimes they're a bit hard to understand. So what we're hoping for here is to really create um, really nice sort of interactive content that is exciting that makes these skills understandable and, and broadly available to the community. Mm -hmm. I'll just add very briefly to that, that uh, the, the existing videos and um, mobile or other digital resources in this space um, have really uh, limited representation. And we have heard from patients and families and from grant reviewers, in fact, that we need to have our, our own co content that's co-created with patients and families, uh, is relevant, it's in line with our values, and is something that we can use flexibly in, in our digital health uh, strategy, as well as in our care pathways. Thank you. I have a quick question, which is that you've mentioned that there are these limited resources and you're offering this in a different format. Um, can you speak to the evidence that this way of delivering DBT is, is similarly effective to group strategies or other strategies um, to be confident that this innovation will achieve the outcomes you're hoping with respect to improved care? Yeah, uh, I think that's a great question as well. So, you know, there is some evidence that people can learn these types of DBT skills online, and there have been some, there has been some research on that. Um, uh, literally, a lot of the materials for DBT are paper and pencil. Like, we literally still give out handouts, and you have to fill them out, and you give them back. And and so, you know, part of this is to bring DBT into twenty into the twenty first century by um, creating these materials that will hopefully last a, a, a whole lifetime really, uh, online. So um, we, we think it, we obviously think it will work um, and it, people, we will appeal to all these different types of learners as well. So not just paper and pencil classroom learners, but also visual, auditory, and just like people who like to listen to stories as well. All right, terrific stuff. Thank you very much, Wise Mind, uh, Wise Minds Group, for that uh, presentation and Q and A. Let's move this along right now and introduce our next group. It is uh, from the Royal, and it's Finance E. Presenters here are Annie Charlebois and Melanie Taylor. Today we're here because uh, we're going to assess your finances. What I have today is a bag of mail. I'd like you to sort through the mail, find the bills, pay them, and balance the account. Checks? Yeah. But I've never written a check before. No. How do you manage your finances? Well, I use my phone. You know those online apps? Like for the bank, sometimes it's complicated, but checks? No. No. Finance E aims to be a modern and more accurate way to assess clients' financial skills in our technological advanced world. Current financial and life skill assessment tools use dated methods to assess clients' financial skills and thus limits how a clinician can obtain useful and precise information to pinpoint potential challenges with skills related to finances and start to offer appropriate treatment and recommendations to client, family, and treatment team. Finance E would offer an accessible assessment format that can be completed in many settings, including hospital. No need to wait for the clients to get privileges or be well enough to be able to go in the community to do financial tasks having access to an e-platform that mimics real life financial skills in a controlled environment will be a time saver for clinicians as they can assess skills and provide feedback to the client and clinical team and detect, react, and protect against financial vulnerability and abuse. Finance E will also allow a teaching component to develop the client's financial management skills. Finance E will be a survey for client and family to identify areas of, of observed strengths and challenges with finances and three different platforms. These platforms will allow the clinicians to assess the client's ability to log on to sites, ability to remember passwords, navigate sites, react to scam emails, pay bills and balance accounts, do online shopping, just to name a few tasks, all in a more realistic way. In order to see this project develop, we greatly need money to create the app and electronic platforms, to purchase tablets, iPhone, Androids, to mimic what clients actually use at home, um, and a portable debit credit machine. 
What we envision as the next steps for our project include creating the app and tech platforms, liaising with clients and OTs to get feedback, and perform research to measure effectiveness and collect empirical data. Thank you. All right, terrific. Thank you very much, Finance eGroup. This seems like a really cool tool. And uh, now I'd like to invite the judges back uh, for a little lightning round with the uh, the Finance eGroup. I could jump in with a, a quick question. Um, has this been tested out uh, in a proof of concept yet with uh, just to to clarify um, the requirements and the needs um, and what you'd want to uh, tie into an assessment? Um, well, we have done a, a needs assessment and um, none of the tools that exist at the moment um, use any sort of form of technology to assess uh, the finances. So yes, it would be an assessment, but we'd also like to use the tool um, to, um, to, to, as a treatment tool as well. So if we can uh, identify areas of difficulties, we can work with clients on setting goals and developing strategies to improve their skills um, related to the areas of difficulty. I have a quick question. Um, would you make um, uh, technology items and these uh, platforms available for clients to practice on while they are also in the hospital? Yeah, I think that that's the point is that while they are in the hospital and can't get out into the community to, to practice these skills, um, that yes, we would make it available to them. Uh, we would certainly um, work with them um, to uh, to improve their skills. Um, I, I actually, I do have a question. Um, so in your assessment or, or the, the test of, of uh, how many individuals that would be part of this, this group, um, would the funding be able to cover all the hardware requirements that you would need if you're going to be supplying um, uh, tablets? So I think the, the idea is that we would um, start out with uh, a few tablets um uh like either um like an ipad or a tablet and uh, depending on what the client uses in their home environment we would practice for them i think the nice thing about this um project is that um it can be used across programs at the royal it can be used with youth with adults with our senior populations and certainly um we would start with sort of the ot group in in teaching uh, all of us how to use it and and um how to use it with clients so I think we'd start on a smaller scale and then sort of build up um, as we see as 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 it um, as we see fit. Maybe I'll just ask one quick question, which is just um, how would you how would you measure or define success of your of this program um, if you were to impl if you were to implement it? I think it would depend on um, each individual clients because each of the clients would have um, their own um, skills related to finances. And I think it would be sort of doing a pre and post measurement, like what are, you know, if you do their, their assessment at the beginning, where are their strengths and difficulties? And then sort of at the end when we, we use the tool and we practice and we develop strategies, um, I guess the indicator would be, can they achieve, have they achieved their goals that they have set?
Finding the right antidepressant that works can be tricky, simply because not everyone experiences depression the same way. Some may turn to comfort eating, while others lose their appetites. On the other hand, clinicians rely on a trial and error approach, prescribing medications that addresses their patient's unique combination of symptoms while minimizing side effects. This makes recovery a rather lengthy process during which the patient may be tempted to drop out. In an effort to reduce the length of this process, we want to create Brighton, a digital companion that can be e-prescribed alongside the depressant. Brighton will provide the patient with information about antidepressants and guide them to monitor the recovery and understand how well the antidepressant is working for them. The day-to-day -day symptom tracker will be available to help patients measure sleep, appetite, mood, energy, and interest. This will allow them to monitor their progress over time, which will also be accessible to their care providers. The information will help clinicians gain a real-world perspective of patients' experience with an antidepressant that can be used to make informed decisions about subsequent care. Brighton will be built on an existing open-source ecosystem using standards like FHIRE for data exchange and Smart on FHIRE to integrate the app with electronic health records. Brighton is also aligned with CAMH's 2020-2023 strategic mission as the long-term goal is to reimagine the patient's journey by supporting recovery in day-to-day -day places that work for them through multimodal adaptability. Brighton could be integrated with smart speakers, offer patients a crisis planner that can keep caregivers in the loop, as well as help patients manage other medications like antipsychotics. Ultimately, Brighton is aimed at providing patients with the agency to play an active role in their own treatment journey by empowering them with the knowledge and means to monitor their recovery together with their care team. All right, terrific. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, presentation from the Brighton Group. We now would like to invite the judges here Lightning round. Again, we're going to try to keep this to three minutes. Uh, Q&A session with the Brighton Group. Maybe a quick one here on my side, Nicola. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation again. Uh, just wondering, um, some of the patients that may not have access to devices, maybe older generations and so on, how can they best benefit from this um, app? Um, I'll take this on. Uh, so in the pilot phase, we will be able to supply those devices, but that bias and uh, continues in the field in general. So if it even goes to a point where people are not able to access portal in some times because portal also sort of needs devices. So there, there is that bias, but I think moving forward, we hope to at least provide value to people who, who can have devices. But in the pilot phase of testing, we will be able to give out test devices as well. I, ha I have a question. Um, first of all, I think it's great that you're delving into um, at-home monitoring, which is present in so many other parts of healthcare, but we really haven't done a lot of it in mental health. I think my question is, is there, an, is, is there a connectivity back? So if you see that someone's deteriorating, uh, what is the connection back to the clinicians and how would you manage that? Stefan, do you want to take that first? Yeah, so um, it will. Uh, so we have experience with these um, uh, with uh, uh, through the integrated care pathways and measurement based care, which we have been regularly using uh, for like more than thousands of patients, for example, in the uh, major depressive disorder uh, integrated care pathway at KMH. And we have experience with patients uh, uh, sending their surveys and, and results. And also when we see a, a worsening of their symptoms. Um, although it's it's clear that uh, we cannot always be online to monitor patients' uh, responses, and we have good experience with like clearly explaining this to patients, providing uh, crisis resources, and uh, explaining um, that the the results may not be reviewed um, before their next appointment. But all these patients are uh, in in regular treatment. So the, the clinicians and physicians will see the results and, and can follow up with the patients um, better than they could without having this information. I have a question. Um, 
Have you thought about integrating with existing apps and other tracker technologies, or are you planning to build all of the different tracking mechanisms yourself? So the goal will be to build an enabling ecosystem and not from scratch, and it will be building on site and on, alongside others. So if this could eventually actually become part of the Kemet digital front door strategy as well, or the app, because the standards will be very similar and uniform. So we do not intend to create yet another app just for antidepressants, but this could be integrated into the future architecture. I have a question, which is during your beta testing, um, what was your experience with patients uh, in their level of trust in sort of providing this information about themselves in an app uh, and being stored uh, on this platform? Um, were there any concerns raised around whether people would uh, feel uncomfortable with this, uh, this way of uh, providing information? I'll take this one on. And so the, the beta testing of this is more like what we have done in San Francisco back in my early days. So this product at Kemich has not been beta tested within Kemich, but outside of it, what we have seen is it all depends on who is asking the patients to provide that information. If it's me as a researcher or, or a clinician scientist who's actually working with the patient. So the trust is really important there. And so the implementation and the patient's willingness to share data depends on where the data is going and startups have struggled with that. Whereas uh, I, I believe based on what we learned from patients, they're more willing to share this data with the providers and the care system. Okay, Brighton Group, thank you so much for that. That was terrific. And now uh, last but certainly not least, our, our final group is from the Royal. It's the Digital Front Door to Rapid Access Addiction Medicine or uh, RAM Clinics presented by Kim Corace. Melanie Willows, and Melissa Webb. COVID interrupted walk-in access to rapid access addiction medicine RAM clinics that provide life-saving care for alcohol and drug use problems. Our team co-designed a digital front door that has improved access to care at RAM clinics and expanded geographic reach, including to rural communities. Getting help is now as easy as walking through our digital front door. Our digital front door replicates the experience of an in-person walk-in visit. Simply check in to the RAM clinic on any one of your devices at theroyal.accessram.ca. Clients and their family members or supporters are connected with a clinician to start their care journey, including seeing other team members as needed. The clinician team dashboard captures all visits and prioritizes clients waiting in the virtual queue. Key performance indicators are captured in real time, allowing continuous quality improvement. Client satisfaction is measured at each visit. Feedback so far has been overwhelmingly positive. We shared the digital front door with over 15 RAM clinics across Ontario, and more clinics across the country want it, since it works. We plan to take this innovation to the next level and make one door a reality. Our clients want one main entrance, or a single access point, to all the partner digital front doors across the province. So no matter where a client is in Ontario, they will be directed to the digital front door closest to them that meets their needs. Our digital front door is the easiest and most accessible health solution in Ontario for people with substance use problems. We have transformed care delivery and built system capacity. The possibilities to scale and spread are infinite. Our innovation is feasible. We have a successful track record, established collaborations, and our partner EMITS is ready to work with us now and within budget. Together, we are co-creating access, hope, and new possibilities. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Digital Front Door Group for that. Uh, we'd like to invite the judges back. One last lightning round. Again, keep this to about three minutes, and the floor is yours. Judges with the Digital Front Door Group. I have a question. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, the performance indicators that you're tracking. You mentioned that you are tracking performance indicators. Where are these performance indicators ending up? Who's looking at them? And what are you doing about them?
sorry. Uh, Sorry, I was on mute twice. Uh, the uh, performance indicators that we capture are built right into the digital front door and actually are being similarly captured across uh, all the clinics that are using the digital front door. So we can capture information related to presenting problem, uh, client issues, client concerns, uh, as well as wait times, performance times, peak use times, flow, number of clinicians seen, et cetera. We capture that daily, actually. It's rolled up, presented back to uh, the clinicians in the clinic, as well as our other partners. Uh, and uh, we work with our co-design team, which includes clients and families regularly. And that's actually what's driven a lot of our future in, uh, iterations and actually the iterations we've made over the last year uh, in response to those uh, indicators. I have a question. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, okay, quick one. Um, uh, given the fact that you, you've trialed this uh, already um, at some of the uh, clinics, what has the feedback been and what barriers do you see uh, to growing this? But what do, you, what do you, you think that you need in order to grow this uh, to um, more clinics? I, I can speak to the feedback and then maybe Melissa or Melanie can speak to the uh, the, uh, the barriers. So actually we already, uh, so five of the partner clinics just when their first launch, uh, their first month of launch actually served 785 different uh, clients uh, during that period of time. Um, we also showed expansion of regional reach and also uh, nearly all the clients, about uh, 86 to 96%, depending on what clinic that you looked at, actually were really quite satisfied with the digital front door as was the staff. Molly, I'll turn it to you in terms of barriers. Sure, and I, and I don't know that it's so much uh, barriers, but part of our process is um, training uh, staff, making sure that uh, clients and families know how to use the tools. So we put things in place to make that happen. I think as far as barriers to moving to that one digital front door, really it is a, a matter of uh, money um, because uh, we would need to uh, build that uh, into the technology. I have a question around your strategy for engagement. Uh, how do you build a foundation of trust? A lot of addiction care is provided in the community, in communities outside of Ottawa. There are already uh, relationships in, in place. Uh, and so, you know, how, how would you approach that and not be viewed as parachuting in, but actually leveraging, you know, what's already in place? So I think what's been cool about this is folks have come to us on to how to do this. So actually the uh, proposal that we developed uh, with this actually was in concert with the other agencies and uh, the other agencies that we've worked with. Of course, we all have uh, multiple um, connections with the community uh, and some of them are community clinics and we've um, made iterations and changes to the um, technology, to the workflows, including the evaluation uh, based on um, uh, our work together. So it's actually our, our collective product at this point. They're just not here with us today because we can only have three people. I don't know, Melissa, if you want to add. No, Kim, I think that uh, that was a great answer. Thank you. All right. Terrific stuff. Uh, thank you very much, Digital Front Door Group, for that. And thank you to all six finalists there uh, for those terrific presentations and uh, sitting through the Q&A. All right. So here's what we're going to do. I think the judges have a lot to, to, to stew on right now and to deliberate about. So they're going to take about 10 minutes. Now, we're going to take a break. Uh, the judges are going to meet separately. Uh, so this is uh, your chance to, you know, get up, stretch, use the washroom, that type of thing. We'll see you back in about 10 minutes from now. Let's say around 1140. Um, we got a, a, a prize draw too. So stick around for you uh, for participating. We've got a couple of tablets to give away. So we'll meet you back here in about 10 minutes. And then uh, we're, we're all set to uh, to give away the, uh, the big prizes too.
I volunteered to be part of a study at the University of Ottawa Institute of Mental Health Research at the Royal, and I had my first ever MRI. I was a little nervous going in, but in hindsight, there was very little to be nervous about. I was in good hands from beginning to end. Here's where I should mention that various studies have different requirements, and what I'm about to describe next may not be the same for all research studies. I arrived at the appointed time and we got started right away. After signing a consent form, a member of the research team asked me about my physical and mental health, and I filled out some questionnaires. I gave a urine sample and changed into a hospital gown. I had to remove my jewelry, which was stored in a locker along with my clothes and handbag. My weight and height were measured, and I had my blood drawn. The Royals Brain Imaging Center features state-of-the-art tools that enable researchers to study the brain in innovative ways. One of these is the MRI. MRI, which stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging, uses powerful magnets and radio waves to capture detailed pictures inside the human body. It looks like a big metal tube that is open at both ends. I was directed to lie down on a narrow platform that extends out of the scanner. I was given a pair of foam earplugs, a warm blanket, a pillow for under my knees, then headphones, and a squeeze ball to hold just in case I needed to signal the technologist for any reason. When I was ready, I gave him the okay to start scanning. It's important to keep still while you're in there because it takes a long time to get an image. I kept my eyes closed for much of the time, but the MRI makes loud noises. I found it challenging to fully relax and think my own thoughts. On the flip side, some people actually fall asleep in the MRI. For this study, four different scans were taken of my brain during my one session in the MRI. Three of them took five or six minutes to capture, during which I watched a slideshow of nature photography. For the fourth one, I was directed to watch the shape of a white plus sign on a black screen for about eight minutes. After it was done, I got to see the pictures they took of my brain, which was pretty cool. Research is key if we want to treat mental illness, advance our understanding, and maybe even prevent mental illness, which is why I'm happy to have played a small part in research at the Royal. Volunteers are needed. For more information about participating in research, go to theroyal.ca. Inside these minds, we come from different places, diverse backgrounds. We are young and old. We are brave. We are scared. We fight similar battles every day. Inside these minds, we are unique, one of a kind, a mold long broken. Illness is what we share, our connection, our common enemy. Inside these minds, survival is measured in minutes, in hours, and in days still alive, living for hope, just living. Inside these minds, we look for the best in ourselves. We accept help from those we love and who love us. We struggle sometimes. Inside our minds, hope is alive. Dreams are in reach. The future is brighter and struggles are few. I lost someone on my crew, but not on the job. The risk has always been there, even before we had a name for it. If you were struggling, you just had to suck it up and move on. But not today. When it comes to PTSD and depression, hope is everything. If you don't have hope, um, hope is what drives you to keep pushing forward. So the research that CAMH is doing um, helps strengthen that hope. For those who um, choose to, to um, assist CAMH in their research financially, um, I'd like to say thank you, um, not just for me, 
uh, but for all the others that uh, this research will help because ultimately it's about helping others. I would like to thank all the people who help out at CAMH. I would also thank all the people who donate to CAMH. I've seen the changes in people, you know, every day. Everybody is helping in one way or another, you know, to get people's lives back to where it was. You're changing their lives and you're making their lives better. So thank you. I just want to say uh, thank you for the opportunity for me to uh, speak on behalf of CAMH. Getting involved in dementia research is very important for me uh, because with my, uh, my journey, my experience, I can um, help um, the direction that uh, the researchers are, are going. I want to thank uh, the, the people who will support uh, down the road uh, the research um, and like from the bottom of my heart I'm thankful for research that's happened already because it has helped me. I honestly believe that supporting CAMH research is one of the most important things that anyone can do. Um, if you know someone who's suffered from mental illness or if you yourself have suffered from mental illness, you understand how difficult it is to live with it and to see people that you love struggle with it. Thank you for supporting the life-saving research at CAMH. Every dollar that you provide towards supporting CAMH changes lives like mine. Thank you. I am extremely grateful for being treated by a compassionate, caring, and understanding support system and medical fraternity at KMH. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart for supporting life-saving research at KMH. When I look at the research CAMH is doing in early intervention services and the possibility of predicting who will be most at risk for developing a psychosis, that in itself will save lives because I think there are people that don't even make it to first episode clinics because you know, what's happened has caused them to take their lives. So it just will be able to give us so much more information to be able to help young people know how to navigate their lives in a safe way. Thank you for supporting the life-saving research that's taking place at CAMH. I would like to say Thank you, Chi uh, Miigwech, which is thank you in Ojibwe, um, for your continuous support within Cam with CAMH in saving um, people's lives and helping people with mental health and addictions. Because CAMH, I can say very confidently, was one of the biggest pieces on on saving my own life. A big part of my struggling within my healing journey was thinking I had to do it alone. And throughout um, the process of my healing, I've learned that that's completely false and we're supposed to, to walk together, heal together, and support each other in this healing journey. All right, welcome back, everybody. And uh, as you might expect, this is uh, proving to be a pretty tight competition amongst those six teams. So our judges are still in deliberation right now. In the meantime, though, let's uh, check in with a previous winner 
of an Innovation Expo event. Uh, they'll give us an update on uh, what their pitch was, where they are now. So let's welcome in the A4i team. Hi, everyone. My name is Amos Adler. I'm the project lead of A4i, the app for independence, the winner of Innovation Expo 2021. I just want to congratulate CAMH and the Royal finalists for a job well done on making it to this stage. I know just how exciting this opportunity can be. As a finalist for Innovation Expo 2021, I understand how impactful this competition can be overall. And as part of this community, we're very proud to be part of such an amazing hub for digital healthcare innovation. Here are my team members, Wen Jia Zhao and Dr. Sean Kidd on what we're up to now. Hello everyone, I'm Wen Jia and I'm the product manager for A4i. And a quick overview of A4i. A4i is a web-based clinician portal and mobile patient application for individuals with schizophrenia. The project started as an experience Dr. Sean Kidd had with a patient and led to some patient co-design and later looping in clinicians to create a product that provides a social feed and specific tools to help patients manage their condition. The project is currently in the middle of various clinical trial and pilots in both CAMH and also at Riverside University Health System in California. So far, we are receiving great feedback from our users, allowing us to continue iterating on the product and increasing our value add to them. Hi, I'm Sean Kidd, Senior Scientist at CAMH and the Chief Scientific Officer of AFRI. I just wanted to thank the Innovation Expo for the critical support provided to us in 2021. That support enabled us to offset some of the challenges we faced in the pandemic, but most importantly supported us in some key technological developments for the platform, which has made it all the more relevant and impactful in our work, our trial work in Toronto, as well as our validation work in Toronto and in California. So thanks again, congratulations to Cam H and the Royal finalists for making it this far. And I wish you the very best for the 2022 Expo. All right, terrific stuff. Great to hear back from the uh, the A4i team. So that uh, that is uh, great stuff. We look forward to seeing what is uh, down the road for you. Okay, judges are wrapping up their deliberations right now. We're going to have the uh, the two grand prize winners announced shortly. Uh, but while they're doing that, we'd like to invite you for a little fun trivia game. You know, we've been talking about technology and innovation all morning long, right? And so we thought, why not put you to the test to see how well you know uh, technology innovation. So here's what's going to happen here. We got a little trivia contest and we're going to have the game displayed on the screen for you, but there's also a web link here, URL for you, uh, to join from your own device. And this is super easy. It's nice and clean from if you're using your phone, tablet, computer, uh, etc. So once you put that, uh, that link, that URL into your device, you're going to be taken to our game page and you're going to kind of be able to play along, answer the questions from your own device. And as we move through the game, uh, every question is going to pop up both on this uh, stream and on your device. I'll read out the questions out loud and then, you know, you get about 20 seconds to answer each question and then the correct answer is going to pop up uh, on your device and on the screen. So basically you lock your answer in, you got about 15, 20 seconds for each uh, question and then we'll have a little bit of fun. So I think we're all set to go and uh, we'll start with the questions here. If we've, uh, if we've got this going here, there we go. Here we go. Question number one. Who is credited with inventing the light bulb? So that's a very simple question. There you go. Who's credited with inventing the light bulb? So you got a couple of options here. So go ahead and uh, and lock in your vote. Like I said, you got about 20 seconds to do that. And uh, which one of these people is responsible for inventing the light bulb? Okay, we got our answers locked in there. And uh, there you go. Nobody got it wrong. It looks like everybody uh, knew that Thomas Edison, uh, you know, he's he's uh, somebody who everyone knows. I think everyone knows. That's 100% of people knew. Thomas Edison invented the, uh, the light bulb, but uh, he's also uh, somebody who just invented so many things and, and, uh, and, and over the years has been, uh, you know, the... the the catalyst for so many great inventions of uh, of the 19th and early 20th century. So there you go. That was an easy one, okay? That was an easy one. Speaking of great innovators and inventors, let's move over to uh, to Leonardo da Vinci, okay? So this is a uh, this is kind of a trick question here. We're going to give you a couple of things here. You tell us what Leonardo da Vinci did not 
invent, okay? Which one of these did Leonardo da Vinci not invent, okay? Robotic knight, self-propelling boat, or a giant crossbow? One of these things was not a da Vinci invention. Which one was it, okay? Give you a few seconds and, uh, well, there we go. Only 14% of you, see, I told you this was going to be a tougher question. Uh, only 14% of you were correctly able to identify that the self-propelling boat was something that da Vinci uh, did not invent. You, you know, here's a fun fact about da Vinci. Because, you, you know, in, in da Vinci's time, there was no patent system to protect his, uh, his inventions and his ideas. So there's a great theory that goes that he used to deliberately... Uh, put mistakes into his drawings so as to protect them from people stealing his ideas. So there was no patent protection at the time. He thought, you know what? If anybody steals my blueprints, they're not going to be able to do this because there's going to be some some simple faults in the drawing. So that, uh, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty innovative. All right, on to the next question. And we're talking about uh, innovations in health and technology. And uh, here's, a, here's, here's one for you. When was, uh, when was the first form of electronic health records available? So we got a couple of decades here for you. The 50s to the 60s, the 60s to the 70s, or the 70s to the 80s. Here you go. See if you can uh, lock in the correct answer here. Let's see if more than 14% of people can get this right. Okay, there we go. And uh, well, we did a little bit better there. 21% of people got this right. Almost one in five uh, of you got that right. And the earliest form of uh, the electronic health records available in the mid 1960s um, as the foundation of development was kind of just beginning and e EHR development evolved with the emergence of course of computerized technology and uh, you know things like the early internet and personalized networks. So there you go, uh, 60s to 70s was the correct answer. All right, speaking of inventions, we're going right back to the well here. And uh, we wanna know which of the following things was invented by a Canadian? Which of the following things was invented by a Canadian. Okay, so we got some options here on the board for you. You got some options. What do we, what, which of the following was invented by a Canadian? Get your answers locked in. Pacemaker, peanut butter, Java pro programming language. Guess what? You know what? Technically, you're all correct. Uh, because it's all of the above. Every one of these was um, was built or, or created by a Canadian. Uh, the first pacemaker, 1949, by Canadian engineer John Hopps. Um, you know, a lot of people think that uh, George Washington Carver was the person behind peanut butter, but actually it was 1884 Canadian pharmacist Marcellus Gilmore Edson was the person who created uh, peanut butter and Java programming language first developed in California, um, but it was an Albertan, um, somebody born in Alberta, uh, James Gosling in the early 90s. So there you go. All right. Now we're going to go to a super young inventor. Okay. How about this? Samuel Thomas Houghton, five-year-old British in, uh, inventor. In 2008, young Samuel uh, received a patent for which of the following ideas? And, and and devices. Which of the following did five-year-old Samuel Thomas Houghton get a patent for? Okay. Here we go. Lock in your answers. And, uh, well, 28% of you got the right one. I can't, I'm not going to lie to you. This uh, illuminating night slippers seems like a good idea uh, to me, uh, anybody who stumbles around in the dark probably knows that would be great. But uh, young Thomas was watching his mom struggle in the yard, trying to pick up the leaves and sweep up leaves. And he had the idea, what if there was a sweeping device with multiple heads? So just happened that his dad's a patent attorney, helped him file the application. And uh, by the way, all the other things on that list were also real patents. But uh, young Thomas there, or young Samuel Thomas, uh, went with the sweeping device with two heads. All right, a couple of more here to wrap it up, and then uh, we're excited to announce our our winners here uh, for the uh, the tablets and, of course, the big fifty thousand dollar prize. All right, when was the earliest telehealth encounter which involved using a telephone? So, going to give you some options here. When's the first time that the telephone was used? 
for kind of a, a health related situation. We're going we're going to 1876. We're going to 1976. We're going to 1920. Okay. So which is the earliest telehealth encounter which involved the use of a telephone? Okay. Get your answers in there. And uh, there we go. Only 13% of people were correctly uh, able to identify this. Uh, that the earliest telehealth encounter, it's Alexander Graham Bell in 1876 when, uh, as he was one of his earliest usage of, uh, of the telephone, was he spilled some acid on his pants and uh, ended up phoning his assistant and uh, said, hey, Mr. Watson, I spilled some acid on my pants. I need some help. So there you go. First time that somebody used the telephone for a little telehealth help. All right. Final one for you here. Uh, 1999, a group of scientists successfully used bioprinting methods to create an artificial organ. We want to know what did they create? What did they create in 1999 using bioprinting? Okay, so you're going to get some options here on the screen. And uh, here we go. Your three options are uh, a kidney, a kneecap, or a bladder. What were they able to successfully bioprint in 1999. Here we go. Get your answers locked in. This is the final question. And, well, it looks like, uh, well, the, the, the fewest number of people got this one, right? It, it was the bladder, where scientists at Wake Forest printed an artificial bladder. Uh, basically, uh, well, what they did is they created an scaf artificial scaffold and then they seeded the scaffold with cells from their patient. And uh, using this method, they were able to grow a functioning organ. And 10 years after the implant, the patient had no serious side effects. That's pretty cool. So 1999, uh, they created the bladder. All right, let's see if we have, do we have a winner here of somebody who went five for seven, six for seven, uh, something of that nature. There we go. There's a little... set up there but there you go there's your winner um for the trivia competition we thank you for playing along and that allowed the uh, the judges to to get their final votes in too for the uh for the uh the, the the two grand prizes all right speaking of prizes here we've got the draw for uh the tablets and i think do we have a virtual drum roll here we might actually have a drum roll. i don't know if we have a legitimate drum roll you it's a legitimate drum roll to help create a little bit of drama and tension. Here we go. Your winners of the two tablets uh, are Natasha Bennett from uh, Camage, Leanne Paisley from the Royal. So congratulations to the two of you. You are both the lucky winner of a brand new tablet and a member of the Innovation Expo Planning Committee will be in touch with you, uh, Natasha and Leanne, to uh, coordinate uh, giving off those prizes. So very cool. Congratulations. All right. Here we go. Uh, now it's the moment we've been waiting all morning for as we uh, close in on 12 noon here. But before we announce the winners, we got to we got to go through the thank yous here. And, uh, you know, uh, all the way back to our keynote speaker, Mohammed, um, Joanne Bezubetz, uh, Megan Maltby, Nicola Ur Urbani, Tracy MacArthur, Alicia Samuel, Brian Wong. Uh, terrific dragons. Great judges. We're looking forward to seeing who you've uh, selected as the winners uh, out of those six finalists. And like I said, there was 44 teams that started here, down to six, um, uh, from Cam H and the Royal that submitted a pitch for this Innovation Expo 2022. And we want to just thank the selection committees from both organizations for reviewing, taking the time to very thoroughly uh, review all of these uh, these finalists here. And thank you so much to the public affairs team, both at CAMH and the Royal, for the amazing support and coverage of this. I know we had more than two, I think it sounds like 250 people watching us here uh, this morning, and uh, it's fantastic. So special thank you to uh, CAMH's Foundation's Gifts of Light, uh, Donna Slate, as well as the University of Ottawa Institute for Mental Health Research at the Royal uh, for sponsoring the Innovation Expo. This certainly wouldn't be possible without your generosity. Uh, huge thanks to Nick Anderson, Ian Taylor at Brand Live for video conferencing and streaming this, making this uh, Innovation Expo as seamless as possible. Now, last but not least, a big thank you to the Innovation Expo Planning Committee, uh, Navi Bopari, uh, Jim Lampley, David Yin, uh, Michaela Berniquez, and Nicole McRonnie-Apau. 
uh, worked tirelessly over the last uh, eight months to put this together. I, you could really see uh, this the way, and I can tell you, sitting in the host chair, I had the easiest job because of the job uh, that uh, that that planning committee did. This was super easy, and you could tell uh, eight months or so went into this. All right, this is what we've been waiting for. Uh, judges have made a decision, and now we would like to invite uh, Tracy MacArthur, who is, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the president and CEO at CAMH, Joanne uh, Bezubetz, president and CEO of the Royal. You're going to come up on stage here, and uh, you're going to announce our two grand prize winners. So we're really excited to invite uh, Tracy and Joanne back onto the big stage. Hi, Thanks everyone. so much, Ian. Go over to you, Joanne. Um, okay, well, I'm not sure what uh, type of uh, format uh, this usually uh, uses, but uh, and we don't have any drum rolls. Um, but what I do want to say before I announce the winner for the Royal is that this was a really tight competition. And I think that uh, we are very inspired by what we saw today and are quite committed to ensuring that um, we are as innovative as possible by investing in these innovations we heard about today. Um, we have wonderful feedback, which can be provided to each of the individual teams, and I will be able to do that with the teams afterwards. Uh, but uh, without further ado, our grand prize winner today is the Digital Front Door. Congratulations, team. Oh, my God. So great news. Thank you, Joanne. And we'll keep moving on because I know we're almost out of time. And I also want to echo my thanks to all of the wonderful teams that uh, are here today. Congratulations to the winner from the Royal. Uh, and we will now move on to announcing our winner from, from a CAMH. So this is a very difficult choice. A lot of wonderful uh, projects. Uh, we're so inspired and so optimistic about the future of mental health care, and I hope that we can continue to do even more of this as we go forward. But without further ado, uh, the winner for the Royal is Wise Mind, or for CAMH rather, is Wise Minds. So congratulations. Wow. Thank so you thank so you so much for the team. And we were particularly impressed by your focus on co-creation with patients and families, as well as providing treatment uh, for the community to bridge uh, very much needed services. So thank you very much to our winning teams. Thank you as well to everyone who participated. There are some wonderful ideas that I hope we can build on after this competition. Uh, and a big thanks uh, to Ian uh, for his wonderful job hosting and bringing all of his energy to us today. We're very grateful for your time. Uh, and thank you to the entire team for organizing the event today. And with that, I think we're at time. And so we will say farewell and thank you everyone and have a wonderful afternoon. All right, terrific stuff. And congratulations to our uh, our two winners today. That was so well-deserved. And as uh, um, our, our judges mentioned there, this was a, uh, this was a tightly contested uh, event that could have gone in a number of directions. So congratulations to our two winners. Before we wrap up, just want to invite our viewers, just visit the polls tab on the right-hand side here on the video stream, answer a couple of questions. Let us know how we could be better in the future. If there's any little uh, hiccups that you saw that you thought we could be better at, because we just want to get better um, in the future. And hopefully we get to do these things in person again. But if we have to do the virtual route, then uh, it's always great to get some constructive criticism and feedback. So listen, congratulations to everybody who participated. Thanks again to the uh, organizers and the judges for putting this all together, because this formally concludes Innovation Expo 2022. I want to thank everybody for joining us and taking their morning here to, uh, to spend their time with us here today. We hope you enjoyed this event. Thank you so much. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your Wednesday.